So you're going to be talking about your topic is the trope factory. Yeah, uh, yeah, a bit of a, a, a vague, uh, mysterious title, but it's really about content and how there's there's an argument that sometimes what we're looking for in um, you know the the ability when we're creating the content is sometimes we're we're desperate to be unique and original and i think sometimes that's not necessarily all that we need to do you know we need to sometimes be perhaps a little bit less original and all that kind of thing that sounds very interesting okay well let's get started yeah, let's and uh the floor is cool. yours hopefully you can now see my screen as well is that all working yeah. as yep we have your screen fantastic well i'll get started so yeah Go as we it. said, um, as David kind of introduced me there, uh, my name's Kelvin Newman. Um, I do a variety of things, but the the main job, um, the main thing that makes up my day is running a digital marketing event called Brighton SEO. It takes place twice a year. Um, three um, three thousand odd people come along to that to meet, learn, and sort of do their job a little bit better. Now, I like to pretend that that you know makes me a huge expert in SEO when the reality is a big part of my day job is actually this kind of assembling stupid stuff I've bought off eBay for the event. Now, I'm going to be talking today about the trope factory. And as we sort of said when we were introducing things, it's about this idea of content. Um, and I'm going to start off by telling you what this presentation isn't about. Um, so for those of you who are kind of expecting this from a presentation, I apologize. This is not what you're going to get. You're not going to get me telling you, you know, this content marketing, it's amazing. You should do some of that stuff. That's exactly not what you're going to get. I'm going to assume that most of you are doing some type of content marketing or at least kind of aware of the value that content marketing could have to your overall digital marketing strategy. I just wanna make it a little bit better, right? Be a little bit more successful. So what we're gonna do here is I'm not gonna com completely reshape the way you think about content marketing. Instead, what I'm gonna try and do is make you think about it slightly differently. Um, that's gonna set you up potentially, I think, to have a little bit more successful approach to content marketing. So that's kind of what I'm gonna take you through. So onto the Jar Jar Binks hypothesis. So the Jar Jar Binks hypothesis is this idea that nobody sets out to make something shit, but the reality is that often we do, right? I don't think anyone who's watching here today will have ever intended to produce a piece of content that doesn't get a good reaction, right? That, that nobody shares, that nobody links, that nobody shares on social media. That was never the plan, but it does happen. And I think it's interesting to kind of take a step back and think about kind of content production as a whole. So what we've got up on the screen here is some really interesting data, right? So they mined the review statuses of all of the films that were on IMDb, right? And all of the, the ratings that were there. And they plotted them, right, in terms of the scores. So the scores on IMDb vary from zero to 10, right? And then upwards there, we've got the frequency, the likelihood of that occurring. Now, those of you who've got kind of much experience in statistics would definitely recognize that, right? That's a normal distribution. That's a bell curve. And the reality is that content, when you look at it as a whole and you ask people to rate it, so here we're looking at kind of user reviews of films, but like if we're looking at shares of content and all of that sort of stuff, you know, you know, the kind of react, if you ask someone how good is this piece of content, it will fit this distribution. And it kind of divides into these kind of three main areas. So you've got your low performers, those that generally aren't very good. You've then got your average performers and then you've got your high performers. Now, the reality is that most of the content we're going to be producing is average, right? That it's not going to be that exceptional high quality content a lot of the time. But the rewards don't go to the average. They go to the excellent, right? So this is another bit of research that's done. So this is looking at the shape of the app store. So looking at the global daily revenue of the top grossing apps in the US. Now, I could have chosen any number of different statistics to illustrate this. But what this shows is that though the quality that we were looking at is on a normal distribution, that's not the distribution you see in terms of the revenue or the rewards. In fact, let's flip that, right? So it's going the other way. And suddenly you can see that actually a lot of these apps aren't necessarily making that much money relative to those that are making the most. So what's the challenge that we're facing? Well, it's this, right? So our quality is on a normal distribution, right? Most of it tending towards the average. The rewards, and that could be revenue, that could be shares, that could be links, that could be any of these things that we're producing, the reason why we're going about and producing that content fits on this pattern. Overlay those two and you can start to see the real challenge here is that the rewards go to the best quality, but actually the majority of content is average. And I think that presents us with a couple of challenges there, right? So there's three approaches that I think if you kind of understand the logic, the, the theory I've got to to get to this place to, to show you this, um, what we've got here, 
right? So if you believe this, that you know most content tends towards to be of an average quality, but the rewards tend to go to those that are the most, you know, most excellent. I think there's three potential approaches that you can take as a consequence. So the first of those would be to play in the tail. Now this is ones that often SEOs find themselves drawn towards, right? So that would be high frequency content that's low cost, right? And it might individually, each individual piece of content have a low marginal return, but it would have a high aggregate value. This is long tail content. Now you need to produce content frequently. You need to produce it as you know as cost effectively as you possibly can. You appreciate that each individual piece will have a relatively little individual value but it aggregates over time the more you produce the more value you get that's playing in the tail now in the middle you've got a slightly different approach right so this is the idea of sort of dying in the middle in my approach so this is the mistake that i think too many content marketers make is that they produce on a medium frequency it's not super frequent but again not super rare um it's a medium cost right it's you know more expensive than this kind of long tail content that we're talking about but it has these two problems, right? So it still has a relatively low marginal return. So each of these average pieces aren't going to see the huge returns, right? It's the bit that's in the middle of that bell curve, not quite seeing the huge returns. But it also has a low aggregate value as well because you're not producing that much of it. So if each individual piece isn't necessarily having a huge impact on your business and, you know, there's not that many of them, then you're not going to see a lot of aggregate value. Then you've got the alternatives. This is kind of the swinging for the fences, the kind of aiming for the blockbusters. Now, this would tend to be low frequency because you can't produce exceptionally high quality content very, very frequently. And as a consequence, it tends to be quite high cost. So it does have a high marginal return, right? So in this instance, because the content is so well produced, there's a greater likelihood that when it is successful, it has a high impact. But it again has a low aggregate value because you're not able to produce it that frequently. So some interesting setups, some interesting ideas there about content and the quality and the rewards we see for it. What's this presentation ultimately about? What is the trope factory? Why do I bring that into this idea of content um, marketing? So if you imagine, a lot of what I've just said here is that whenever we're producing content, we're, there's a, a balance between the cost it takes to produce, and, bit, and I mean cost in the kind of broadest sense, the time, the effort, the professional work that's got to go into that, and the quality, right? And we're believing that the greater the quality is, the greater the return. And now if you plot cost against quality, you know, of, of all your pieces, or indeed all those that are produced in a sector, you'll get a pattern somewhat like this, right? So it's not kind of as straightforward that always the more you spend, the best return you're going to get. But typically, there's a kind of relationship between them. They're often low cost is low quality and low return. High cost is, you know, generally good. And you've got a split there as well. And what I want to do is overlay a four box matrix. I love a four box matrix. And I think actually what you then start to do is you take the idea of these pieces of content that we previously had, right? So the ones we've got here, this kind of graph, overlay what we've got here. And I think you start to see kind of almost four different types of pieces of content. Now, I think in the top right-hand corner, you've got the blockbuster, right? So this is high cost, high quality, very likely to achieve a good return, right? And then left of that, you've got the cult hit. So again, very high quality, um, lower cost in this instance. Then in the bottom, we've got the peanuts, right? Those that are low quality, low cost. I'm not saying there's no value in that, but it's about the marginal return, right? So it's about aggregate value. And then in the bottom corner, um, we've got flop, right? Where it's low cost and, uh, no, sorry, high cost and low quality, right? And what I want us to do, like generally speaking, our challenge is, is that what we want to do is kind of move them up, right? So we want to improve the quality whilst not dramatically impacting the costs, right? So we want to turn our peanuts content um, that's kind of low quality, low cost to produce and try and turn it into a cult hit. And we want to avoid our flops being expensive flops and make them the blockbusters that we believe they should be. And tropes are one way of doing that, right? And the tropes are all about this idea of that there's existing ways of doing things. And the idea is that we start here, right? So we start with an average idea and allows us then to use our creativity to make it great rather than starting from scratch, right? So that's the logic of what I'm going to take you through here. So a trope is kind of, it's a movie, um, you know, movie studies, um, TV, media studies, what I did for my degree, it's that kind of idea, right? A trope is a noun and it's a significant or occurring theme. In fact, a really good word that perhaps is more commonly used is a motif, right? And these motifs and patterns are in all works of art. And kind of if you start to get down to it, there's they appeal to something innate about us, 
right? They kind of appeal to something human and overreaching. And now, this might feel a bit kind of over elaborate if you're just kind of, well, I'm producing a blog post for my accountancy firm. But actually, as we start to get into this, you'll see that tropes can be a powerful way of shortcutting um, your creative process. So you start with an average quality idea and can make it great rather than starting with an idea that's of a lower quality. And understanding these patterns, understanding what's successful, what's worked, allows us to shorten the odds of our content success. Now, I know there might be some skeptics among you, among you, right? So you're kind of listening to this and going, yep, I see what you're doing here, Kelvin, And but won't this just make all of my content samey and derivative? Well, I don't think that that's the case, right? So I'm going to show you a couple of examples here. A couple of films that I'm a big fan of, Deadpool and, and um, Scissorhands, Edward Scissorhands, right? These are... Beauty and the Beast, right? They're a trope. The Beast is usually a monster, physically capable of great rage and destruction. Beauty is kind and smart and emotional. The Beauty sees the good in the Beast in the world, and Beauty brings out the best in the Beast. And this often leads to Love Redeems, which is another trope, right? Two films, very, very different in their execution, very, very different in their style, in their approach, in their audience that they attract, but they're still a Beauty and the Beast story. Now, you probably recognize that one, right? That's kind of a, a common story arc. But there's some others that are more subtle, right? And um, this is Big Hero 6 with Baymax, very, very good film. Um, one of my kids' favorites, but also one of mine. And A Scanner Darkly, right? Very different film, very different approach, very different audience. But there's similarities, right? There's a trope that describes exactly this type of film, right? Which is 20 minutes in the future. So this is the future but not so far into it that you'd notice and it'd feel alien. It's often a linear extrapolation of a national malaise or existing crises, right? So the American works of the 1970s, um, you know, it had skyrocketing crime and inner city urban decay, right? So you had films built around that, whereas in the 1980s, you had the notion of megacorps and that Japan was going to rule the world. So all the films were based around that 20 minutes into the future, right? A similarity to very different artistic products actually when you get down to it huge similarities and you get it with characters as well you know we've got black adder uh, uh, and our, our favorite jar jar there as well the bumbling sidekick right an annoying incompetent sidekick for another character who barely tolerates them right and some bum and bumbling sidekicks are delusional and think that they're appreciated others are just desperate for friendship or money um, to leave right again a trope a similarity a pattern to very different products some huge similarities, huge creative differences between them. And then one that I often refer to, one I like a lot, the MacGuffin, right? So this is a plot device that's some form of goal or desired object or other motivators that the protagonist pursues, often with little narrative explanation. And the specific nature of a MacGuffin is typically unimportant to the overall plot. Basically every superhero film is this, right? The Tesseract that goes through all of the Marvel comic universe at the moment in film, that, that that's a MacGuffin, right? The suitcase in uh, in Pulp Fiction is mocking the MacGuffin, right? There's this idea of the, you know, every Indiana Jones film is the same as well. Now, hugely different films, right? You could not say the Avengers and Pulp Fiction are similar products, yet they still have the MacGuffin, they still have the trope. And I'm pointing all these out not to belittle these films, right? But rather point out that there's a huge variety of film that can have shared elements. And that's my key sort of learning here today. So, you know, think of them as building blocks, which you allow you to construct ideas. That's what tropes are. They're building blocks. They're shared, similar patterns that people respond to that we can then use to build something unique off the back of that. So I've gone off. I'm talking about film studies. I'm talking about IMDb ratings and normal distributions. What's that got to do with the nitty gritty of digital marketing? Well, I think you need to understand the tropes in your sector, right? Because there will be tropes. And if you can understand them and you find those building blocks, then the creativity comes in the combination of those building blocks. Now, if you don't understand those tropes, you don't start with the building blocks, right? You start before that, you then got to go and build the bricks to build the, you know, the building of it rather than starting with the bricks that are already there. <coughs> so what we want to do when we're looking for the tropes in our sector, in our industry, is we want to discover subtle lessons. The problem I see too frequently and a mistake I've made in the past is that we look for the tropes, we look for the patterns, and we discover 
unsubtle lessons, right? And we, you know, then end up producing stuff like this, the top 10 Kim Kardashian selfies with kittens that will blow your mind, right? That's not what we're going to want to produce out of learning. That's the Jar Jar Binks lesson, right? That's the kind of, you know, you're looking but not really understanding, right? You want insights, not observations. So what might be a trope that you might find? Now, these are just examples that I found when doing research in the past, right? These may be applicable to your business. They may not be, but you need to look and understand and look for these types of understandings. So we want to find out things more like our audience is risk averse. So prefer articles about avoiding disaster rather than achieving success. So if that's a trope in your sector, the content is about kind of how to avoid these mistakes. And we believe that's because it's loss aversion. That's really powerful, right? When you're next brainstorming your content, you plan in a very different way if you know that your audience is risk averse. Another one might be like this, right? So all our readers like to show off in front of their friends, right? That's an insight that you can act upon, right? So when you're creating your content, you go, well, how do I pr produce a piece of content that will allow my audience to present a good version of themselves to their friends socially, right? That's a kind of a sociological insight that we've got there. So I've whistled through it, right? But I've given you some ideas that I hope will change the way you think about content. And what I want to leave you with now is some quite practical things you can do when you get back to the office, right? I know today we're on a webinar and you're probably already at the office, right? But these are things that I think you can do straight away that potentially will allow you to build upon this idea of tropes that we've talked about. So many of you will know Answer the Public. If you don't, it is an exceptionally good tool. It's like Uber Suggest, but it makes Uber Suggest seem kind of basic, right? And old fashioned. Now, what, um, what um, Answer the Public does is it scrapes the contents from Google Suggest and combines them with prepositions and questions as well as the conventional Uber Suggest additional letters in the alphabet. So up here on the screen, we've got one screenshot. They visualize it in a quite interesting way that drops very nicely into presentations. So this is you know buying a house as a C term, and it goes buying a house with your parents, with someone, with your partner, with a boyfriend, with a sitting tenant, with a family with bad credit, with asbestos, with damp, with cash process, right? You know, all that we've got there are suggestions for really straightforward content ideas that we can produce, right? Now, I don't think any of these on their own as a piece of content is going to dramatically shift the needle in terms of the links and social shares that you get. But using this as a starting point then allows you to produce more creative content, right? So if you want to go and produce a video, you've now got questions you can ask, right? You want to play in the tail and produce really kind of um, relatively low cost content to produce that's going to have an aggregate effect. This is a great place to start. Another one I like to do as well is word clouds. Now, everyone knows word clouds, right? I'm not going to teach anybody really new that word clouds exist. But one that I've not seen as many people do as they potentially could, this is a very quick thing you can do. It will take minutes to implement, but it's incredibly powerful in your next content brainstorming session, right? Or your, your next client meeting or your next meeting where you're kind of meeting up with your content team. Take BuzzSumo or any of those kind of tools out there that allow you to find the most socially shared content in your sector. What I like to do is then go through the top 10 of my competitors, get their top 500 most socially shared articles from the last 12 months, take all of those titles and pop them in a word cloud. And you get things like this, right? So this is from Business Insider, right? And we've got the word will there. That was like their most common word in their headlines that went on to be socially successful, right? You know, that, that's a really interesting insight, right? So we've got the, their stories that get the most social shares are out about people taking action, right? That insight is something that I can respond to. We've also got things like lots of mentions of names, right? So we know that they like content around names. We know that words are like tips are in there. We know that days there, so there's a time aspect that they like content that's topical and timely, right? We can see the brands that are getting a good response as well. So you can see very quickly that this is kind of the thing that any content person could very quickly learn from. But we're not just looking at the words here, we're kind of looking at the underlying needs, right? What are the building blocks that are there that are making up this successful content that we can bring together in new and inventive ways? I've even put together a Google Doc. If you drop me an email, it's not one that's kind of like a super polished tool, right? But it's essentially this Google Doc where you drop in your title, right? Like wedding. And I've taken from a lot of sites these kind of 
formats, right? 10 wedding confessions, right? 10 wedding ideas for summer, you know, lazy wedding hacks, right? And all you're doing is kind of dropping in the word there and you're getting great content ideas. Like 50% of the suggestions that come out of a tool like this will be rubbish, right? But what we're looking for is the 50% that are good, that have given us a shortcut that allows us the idea that we get the idea really quickly and then we concentrate on the execution right so we're kind of easing that process and my final tip is whenever you're trying to access assess or kind of understand the success of a piece of content that someone else has produced um i really like this method called the seven whys there's lots of different reputed sources of this approach it's one that's used quite a lot in kind of consulting and kind of business problem solving. Um, I think Toshiba um, are kind of one of the um, companies that are originally credited with it, but it doesn't really matter who came up with it, right? It's just a really great way of examining and genuinely understanding something. And I think it's incredibly powerful as a tool to understand why certain pieces of content are successful. So I'm gonna take you through how it works. Now, essentially the seven whys is just a case of asking a question, answering it, and then following that up with the word why and doing it seven times. And you kind of get to the underlying truth of something in a really interesting way doing this. So I'm going to give you a bit of an example of how this would work. Right. So Nomad List, right. The question I'm asking is why is Nomad List such a successful website? Why? Because it helps people decide where is a good place to remote work. Why? because it has comprehensive information about different places suited to remote working. Why? Because lots of people want to work remotely and overseas, but aren't sure where. Why? Because although the idea of remote working is appealing, the reality is daunting. Why? Because working in a country where you've never visited is scary. Why? Because we don't know, we wouldn't know what to expect from those places. Why? Because change is appealing, but also scary, right? That's my final why there. And I think that it's far more useful for us as a content prompt to have the prompt change is appealing, but also scary. That's much, much more useful to prompt new content ideas, ideas that's gonna resonate with your audience than a prompt like information about remote working is popular, right? Because there's so much more that that allows us to do. It's an understanding, it's an insight, it's an observation about the type of people who we want to attract that change is appealing, but is also scary. And why do I say this? Because bad artists imitate the great artists steal, right? This quote is, is one that's, again, it's self-stolen quite a lot, and that's the fun around it, right? I don't think that we need to start from scratch a lot of the time. We can learn from what's worked, learn from the tropes, use them as building blocks, and then get creative in the way we put them together. And if you enjoyed this, you'll probably also enjoy the website TV Tropes. It lists all of those, and be prepared. When you go to the TV Tropes website, you're going down a rabbit hole. You're there for the rest of the evening. But that's me. Um, I'm Kelvin Newman. As I say, these slides are available on slideshare.net at Kelvin, um, slideshare.net slash Kelvin Newman. Um, you can get in contact with me at Kelvin at brightonseo.com. And I have the very imaginative first name, last name. That's my Twitter username. Thanks very much, everybody. That's great. Thank you very much, Kelvin. Um, always good to see a four box matrix in a presentation. Yeah, can't so, go wrong with that, can you? You know, really? you, you've made my day there. Uh, and also interesting to hear about the, the motifs, the, the tropes coming out of the storyline. I thought that was that was fantastic. I've got to say, I do wonder whether the, the asking the, the seven whys originally came from a seven year old pestering parents. <laughs> Um, yeah, yeah, well, no, yeah, it, yeah it's, 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 I certainly, I know that my two uh, who are around about that age at the moment um, definitely have that kind of approach. But it, it's one of these ideas that, like, it seems so silly, right? You're going, oh, I'd never actually use that. But do it. Because when you yeah. start to kind of really try and examine, if we want to learn from what is working from other people, we, we need to take a bit more of a sophisticated approach than just the kind of, yeah, that was successful because it's good, right? That doesn't help me. Um, I want to try and understand what's the fundamental thing, what's the itch that this content is scratching, that then I can learn from that. Because this is what allows you to genuinely learn from the success, rather than just like replicate, right? So if you can understand that kind of, 
you know, and I know this is a bit of a cliche in that nomad list one, but that kind of knowing that people want to do new things but are scared to do them allows you to create so many different content ideas that's far more useful than people are interested in remote working. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one, one interesting question I have is, um, you know, about 18 months, two years ago, we heard about uh, the 10x content and, you know, the, the, the talk about, you know, mm. developing this, this hard and fast content that was, that was detailed. Uh, how does that fit in with your, your trope factory? Well, I mean, I think, yeah, this idea that like, this certainly is coming from a similar place, right? Because what the the idea that that 10x content, you know, that 10 times content is, you know, the stuff that gets the reward is exactly what that app store data that was overlaid there. There's that only the content that is genuinely exceptional, that is genuinely of a really high quality is going to see rewards. Now, I think that, you know, the addition that I've made there is that kind of, you know, a lot of us are still producing average content, which again, I think would be kind of underlying in that 10x theory now. Now, I think the difference I would have is that some people would be, well, you only produce 10 times content. Um, I think my difference is, is that there is a place for content that um, perhaps doesn't, you know, change the world, right? That isn't the best ever piece of content that's ever produced. But it's just about finding a balance, right? And it's not about producing horrible spun content that's there but kind of when you're producing a piece of content when you're brainstorming you need to understand what you're trying to achieve and say is this a piece of content that is intended to deliver huge returns and therefore what you're then trying to do is manage costs down but still kind of understanding that you've got the return or is it a different one and, and there's another kind of related one that I didn't mention here but I think is kind of worth thinking about which I think is this idea of kind of venture capital um, you know, like, so when you're a venture capital firm, you invest in lots of businesses um, and you expect many of them to fail. Um, but when you're choosing those businesses, because you expect that many of them are going to fail, you take an approach which is, well, I will only invest in the businesses that if they are successful, will have a significant return. And I think that's the kind of the approach that I take to the 10x content is that the criticism I would make of that is that it perhaps encourages people to produce less content of a really high quality, which I think is in general a good idea. But if you're not placing enough bets, you know, you're not going to see enough of a return. And that is the danger in content marketing is I've seen people spend huge amounts of time, often huge sums of money, but I think the time is probably a bigger issue and then find it doesn't deliver a return. Now they would have been better off, I think, in kind of hedging bets and seeing what the, the difference is there and kind of almost that like trying to get more of the, the cult hits in that four box matrix rather than the risk of being a flop or a, a, a a blockbuster i think generally speaking it's better to try and become one of the cult hits rather than necessarily try and produce a blockbuster because it's probably a safer bet that sounds good to me okay uh thank you very much kelvin and uh if i don't see you before i probably will i'll see you at the next price in seo see, yeah see everybody then good to see you today. thanks for having me along and yeah um hopefully there were some interesting and practical bits people might be able to try out there at the end as well